Welcome to part three of my lecture series on Rian Chow interpolation. In today's talk, we're going to be jumping in and deriving the Rian Chow correction formula itself. We're going to be starting from first principles with a derivation that you can follow along with from start to finish. And once we've arrived at the final correction formula, I'm also going to be explaining to you what the different terms in the correction formula actually mean so that you can understand them in a lot greater detail. And you'll also see why the correction formula itself is successful at damping out the checkerboard oscillations that we introduced in part one. This is going to be a great talk. You're going to find exactly what you're looking for. Let's get into it. So in part two of this lecture series, we were talking about staggered grids. And in part three, the focus is going to be on co-located grids, which are used by the majority of mainstream CFD codes like OpenFOAM, ANSYS Fluent and Star CCM. And just a quick reminder for you guys, on a co-located grid, all of the flow variables, so velocity, temperature, pressure, turbulent kinetic energy, they're all calculated and stored at the cell centroid. So when you solve the Navier-Stokes equations and the scalar transport equations, what you're doing is you're calculating the value of these field variables at the centroid of the cells in your mesh. And of course, between those cell centroids, the flow variables vary linearly at best. And this is different to the staggered grid that we looked at last time, where the velocity was calculated on a separate grid, which was centered around the face center. Now, because we're using a co-located grid, what we do in the uh, standard procedure in a simple or piezo type algorithm is we solve the momentum equations first. So the first thing we solve is the equation for u, for v, and for w. And that means we have a value of the velocity at all of the cell centroids in the mesh. Now the next stage in that algorithm, as you may remember from some of my previous talks, is to assemble and solve an equation for the pressure correction. And in order to assemble and solve this equation, what we need is we need to calculate the mass flux through the faces of the cells. And of course the mass flux or mass flow rate being density times velocity times area, we need to know what the velocity is on the faces of the cells. So we've calculated the velocity at the centroids by solving the momentum equations, and we now need to calculate the velocity at the center of the faces. We can work out how much mass is moving in and out of each of the cells. Now, the straightforward method to do to do this would be to say, well, we know that the flow variables vary linearly between our cell centroids at best, so can't we just use linear interpolation and calculate the value of the face velocity uf directly? Well, if you think back to part one of this lecture series, you'll remember that when we use a co-located variable arrangement, when we're calculating all of the variables at the cell centroids, if we use linear interpolation for the face velocity and then assemble and solve the pressure correction equation, what we find is that the pressure field can exhibit checkerboard oscillations. And if you need a reminder of that phenomenon, please go back to part one and have a reminder of how these checkerboard oscillations can appear. But briefly, what the checkerboard oscillations are is that there can exist two independent solutions on the same mesh because the pressure is corrected in is a uh, pressure is connected to every other cell, skipping a cell in the middle. And that would mean if you plotted along a line through a 1D mesh, for example, you may see a solution similar to that on the right hand side of this slide here, where the pressure is oscillating between those two independent solutions. And in part two of this lecture series, in the last talk, we went through the first method that we can use to correct and remove these oscillations, and that's the method of using a staggered grid. Now in part three, in this talk, we're going to go through an alternative method of avoiding these checkerboard oscillations, and that is to correct the linear interpolation method that we use for the face velocities. And this definitely nowadays is the most popular method that CFD codes use to avoid checkerboard oscillations. Now, before we go into the derivation of the re and chow correction, the first thing we're gonna do is just look at the notation because there are some different subscripts and superscripts for the terms that you'll see in the derivation. And so it's important that we understand what they all mean first before we go into the derivation. And if you look on the internet for various explanations of re and chow interpolation, you'll find people using a variety of different notations. Now, 
I'm going to be using notation from uh, a paper by Bartholomew et al, which is linked in the description below. And the reason I've chosen to use this notation is rather than the original uh, Rian Chow paper, the notation is a lot clearer and the derivation is also a lot more comprehensive. So if you want to go ahead and follow the original paper or look at the derivation in more detail, you can just follow the link in the description below and you'll see everything that I do in this talk will be consistent with that paper. So it'll be easier for you to follow along. Now, the basic idea of the Re and Chow interpolation is we're going to be considering two cells in the CFD mesh. We're going to be considering uh, cell P on the left, which you can see in a slightly darker shade of blue there. And cell P is the main cell that we're interested in. And it has a centroid, which I've labeled capital P to denote the centroid of that cell. And then on the right of that cell, we're going to consider a cell E or the east cell on the east side of that main cell. And the centroid of this cell we're going to denote with a capital letter E. And the reason we're using capitals here is often in derivations for these numerical methods, you'll find capital letters using to refer to centroids, whereas lowercase letters refer to faces. And because we're considering two cells, a cell P and a cell E, those, those cells share a common face. And the center of that common face we're going to be denoting with a subscript lowercase f. So at the moment, we're only considering two cells that are connected by a single face. But of course, in a general unstructured mesh, you could consider uh, any two cells that are connected and the shared face between them. The derivation would still be exactly the same. And the first thing to do in this derivation is to understand what we mean by linear interpolation mathematically. So for this example, let's suppose that uh, cell P is a perfect square and then cell E is a stretched rectangle. And what we want to do is we know the velocity at the centroid of P, that's UP, and we know the velocity at the centroid of E, that's UE, because we've solved the momentum equations at this point. And we want to know what the face velocity is, UF. And of course, the way we would do that with linear interpolation is to draw a straight line between those points. And then we would say the fraction of the distance between P and E will give us the value of the face velocity, UF. And the way that we can write this down mathematically, you can see there in equation one, where we've got L sub X, that's uh, a notation used for the sort of interpolation distance. You can think of LX as the fraction of the distance one between P and F, which you can see there on the slide, and distance two, which is P and E. And of course, if uh, cell F, if the face F was very close to cell P, then the distance one would be very small. And so LX would tend towards zero, in which case UF would be equal to UP. Whereas if the face F was very close to cell E, then distance two uh, and distance one would be very close together. Distance one would also almost be equal to distance two. And so LX would tend towards one. And so you can see an equation below that uh, then UF would equal the other term, which you can see there. So LX is really just giving the fraction of the distance between those two points. Now, what we're gonna do is to introduce a slight simplification to this notation so that it's consistent with the notation used by uh, Bartholomew et al and others. And what we'll do is we start with linear interpolation, and that's that blue line which you can see there in the figure, where we're just drawing a straight line between the points, and the fraction of the distance is going to give us the face velocity. Now, in the Re and Chow interpolation method, we want to derive a correction to this formula, because that's what we're trying to do here. We're trying to correct the Re and Chow interpolation method. And so we could write this in a combination of mathematics and English in some kind of form that you can see there in equation two. We've got UF is equal to the standard linear interpolation formula plus some correction, which we haven't come up with yet. We're expecting another term to appear on the right-hand side of that correction formula. And what we're gonna do now is introduce uh, an overbar notation to simplify and represent that linear interpolation chunk of the formula. And what we're gonna be using is using a single uh, solid overline above the UF to denote to the reader and to anyone who's following the derivation that that just equals the value of the face velocity interpolated at that point with linear interpolation. And we've still got this correction on the right hand side, which we haven't come up with yet. And the big question in this talk is, what is that correction and how do we derive it? And 
What I'm going to do now is before showing you the mathematics, as I want to introduce to you the idea of how we're going to derive this correction. And the idea behind the correction is that we're going to draw a staggered grid cell around that face F. And you can see that there in the diagram. We're defining a staggered grid cell where the centroid of this staggered grid cell is the center of the face F. And you've seen this idea before in part two of this lecture series, where we looked at the staggered grid approach, where all of the uh, momentum cells for U and for V were staggered throughout the mesh. But what we're gonna do with the Re and Chow interpolation procedure is we're going to do the same thing. We're gonna define a staggered grid cell around that cell face F. But then the key difference in this point is that we're going to write the momentum equation for this cell F, but then we aren't going to solve it. In the staggered grid approach, we would just solve that momentum equation directly, but we're not gonna do that in the co-located approach that we're going to do here. What we're gonna do is we're gonna write a momentum equation for the staggered cell, and then we're going to rearrange that and rewrite it in terms of the variables at cells P and E. And that will allow us to arrive at the Re and Chow interpolation formula. So a way, another way you can think of this is rather than drawing, uh, drawing a line between P and E and saying we're going to use linear interpolation, what we're effectively doing is we're saying between P and E, we're going to do a momentum balance. That's the key conceptual difference uh, in the approaches here. So the next question is, how do we derive and write down this momentum equation for that staggered cell F? Well, the way we're gonna do that is we're gonna start very simply by starting by deriving the momentum equation just for cell P, for the co-located standard cell that we're used to doing. And then once we've done that and we've understood how to derive a momentum equation for a conventional cell P, we're then going to apply the same approach to the staggered cell F. And then we're going to do some rearranging and that will allow us to arrive at our final solution. And what I want, you want to do here is to rather than start from the very beginning of the derivation, because it takes quite a long time to do, is I'm going to start halfway through the derivation using the same stage that we got to in part one of this lecture series. So if you flip back to part one of this lecture series or to the lecture notes if you have those, then you'll see that we can write the momentum equation for cell P in a discrete form. So we've started with the full Navier-Stokes equations as partial differential equations, and we've used the finite volume method and simplified uh, some of the terms, and we arrive at this discrete form of the U momentum equation for cell P. And just for a quick reminder, so you, so you recall what we're looking at here, we've got the left-hand side of that equation where we've got, uh, we've got some coefficient AP multiplied by UP, where UP is the velocity at the centroid of that cell P that we're interested in. And then we've got a summation term. And these coefficients, AP and AN and summation, what they represent is they represent all of the convective and diffusive fluxes of momentum from the cells that surround cell P. So there's gonna be some convection of momentum in from the left, from the top, from the right and the bottom. And that's what those summation terms represent. And then on the right hand side, what we've got there is we've got the pressure gradient across cell P. So remember, of course, uh, I've got the minus sign for the pressure gradient because uh, pressure a standard gradient, of course, goes from uh, low to high. So if you uh, go up, that's a pressure gradient in that direction. But of course, when we think about pressure gradients driving flow, it's pressure going from high to low, so a negative pressure gradient that actually drives and accelerates flow, which is why there's that negative sign there in front of the pressure gradient. And so this discrete form of the momentum equation for cell P, we've derived it before, but what it just means physically is for our cell P, the sum of the convective and diffusive fluxes into that cell P balance the pressure gradient across the cell. And if you want some more details of how that's derived, please go back to part one and you'll see it in a bit more detail. Now, in order to derive the Re and Chow correction, what we need to do is a bit of rearranging and simplif simplifying this equation. So the equation is still going to mean the same thing. It's just a balance of convection and diffusion into that cell is gonna balance the pressure gradient across the cell, but we're just gonna rearrange a few of the terms and collect them together so it's easier for us to deal with in the derivation. And the way we're gonna do that is start by uh, moving the summation term on the left-hand side to the right-hand side of the equation, and then dividing all of the terms by AP, 
So at this point, we've now got equation six, UP is equal to minus one over AP, that's the diagonal coefficient for UP, multiplied by the summation, and then again, subtracting the pressure gradient, but this time divided by AP. And just to recall this, it still means exactly the same thing. We've still got a balance of, of U momentum here in our equation, but we've just rearranged a few of the terms to make them easier to deal with. And what I'm now gonna do is introduce a bit of further simplification to collect up some of these messy terms so they're a bit easier for us to deal with. And again, the notation is consistent with what's used by uh, Bartholomew et al in the paper below, and also in many of the other sources you'll see in the literature. And the notation that those authors introduce is they introduce this quantity dp, which is just the cell volume vp, the volume of cell uh, p, divided by that diagonal coefficient ap. And they also introduce this term up tilde. That's up with a with a squiggle symbol on top of it, and that's just used to collect together that first summation a n u n divided by the a p. And when we introduce these terms dp and up tilde, we arrive at equation nine, which you can see here. And Already, I just want to bring you back and remind you that we haven't changed any of the meaning here. We've still got the U momentum equation for that cell P, and all we've done is just introduced some simplifications with DP and UP, uh, UP tilde to collect those terms together. And this is just a diagram to remind you or to help you visualize really what's going on here. And in this 1D mesh that we're considering for the example, we've got UP, that's our main cell in the middle, and of course into that cell we're going to have some convection and diffusion going into the cell, and that's kind of represented by UP tilde. And then we've also got the pressure gradient across the cell uh, multiplied by DP, and so the pressure gradient is balancing those fluxes in and out of the cell. That's all we're doing here. So we've written an, a momentum equation for cell P, and one of the advantages of writing the momentum equation in this form is that we can quite easily now write a momentum equation for cell E as well. All we need to do is change the subscripts in our equation 10, and that allows us to get to equation 11. This time we've got UE is equal to UE tilde minus the pressure gradient across that cell. Again, we're saying the same thing, that the momentum at the centroid of cell E will just be equal to the convective and diffusive fluxes of momentum into cell E, and then minus the pressure gradient across cell E this time. So very simple, but using this very simple approach, it allows us to go on and write the momentum equation for the staggered cell F, which is what we're interested in. This is what we're gonna to use to derive that Re and Chow correction formula. And we can actually use exactly the same approach that we did before. We can just change the subscripts on that momentum equation and that allows us to arrive at equation 12. We've got UF is equal to UF tilde minus the pressure gradient across that cell. So again, just bringing it back, what we're talking about here is that the momentum or the velocity UF at the centroid of the staggered cell, which corresponds with the center of the face that we're interested in, is just going to be equal to the momentum, uh, the sorry, the convective and diffusive fluxes into that cell minus the pressure gradient across that staggered cell F. And we've actually made some excellent progress here because looking closely at equation 12, UF is actually what we want. This is the UF, the face velocity, that we're going to use to replace that linear interpolation that we have used before and found to produce checkerboard oscillations. However, we need to do a bit of thinking because we haven't quite got the equation yet because the tricky term is actually that UF tilde. Those are the convective and diffusive fluxes into the staggered cell because the staggered cell is halfway between the other cells. We don't really know at this point what's the uh, convective and diffusive fluxes coming in and out of the faces of that cell because we've shifted it now. So we need to do a bit of rearranging and that will be the process that allows us to arrive at our final equation for UF. And I just wanted to really crystallize that in a single slide because I know the notation can be difficult if you're not careful. And so at the moment we've got equation 13, which is the momentum equation uh, for the U momentum for that staggered cell F. And you can see we've got UF, which is what we want. And then we've got UF tilde, which isn't really what we want. We need to get rid of UF tilde at some point. And what we want to do is to write this equation in the form of equation 14, which we introduced earlier. 
where uf is equal to uh, some uh, linearly interpolated face velocity plus some correction. So hopefully you can see where we are currently and where we're trying to get to. And it's important at this point to really get clear in your minds that uf tilde and uf with the overbar are different quantities. They don't represent the same thing. We want to get rid of uf tilde and we want to arrive at uf with an overbar. And so how are we going to get rid of uf tilde? Well, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to just suppose that we can use linear interpolation, the same method that we did before, to get uf tilde. And we could use the same approach that we did before and write lx multiplied by up with the tilde again, and then plus one minus lx multiplied by the ue with the tilde. So now at this point, we're saying, well, the uf tilde is unknown, but could we just linearly interpolate it from the from the tildes in the cells P and E on the left and the right hand sides, because we've seen those quantities before and they've appeared. So if we somehow can work out what those quantities are, we can then just linearly interpolate them together and use that to substitute and get rid of UF tilde. And it turns out we do know what UF, uh, UP tilde and UE tilde were. We saw those before when we wrote the momentum equations for cells P and E. And so what we're gonna do is take our linear interpolation formula there, equation 15, and substitute in the momentum equations for UP tilde and UE tilde, and you arrive at equation 16. Uh, noting, of course, that we've now got the plus sign in there rather than the minus sign, because we've rearranged that momentum equation uh, to put uh, UP tilde on the left-hand side and UE tilde on the right-hand side. So the minus sign has swapped there. And if you need to get a pen and paper and write that down for yourself, I'm sure you'll find that that's the case. So we're getting closer now. We've now got an expression for uf tilde that we can then substitute back in to our original uh, momentum equation for the staggered cell, and then that's gonna give us what we're looking for. So we're almost there. We just need to do a bit of rearranging and we need to be quite careful with our terms and make sure that we don't miss anything. And if we do that, the first thing we're gonna do is take equation 16 and just rearrange and pull out the velocities and the pressure gradients and collect them together. So you can probably see by looking at equation 16 there, we can quite easily pull out uh, the velocities and the pressure gradients and collect those together. And that's what we're gonna do. And when you pull out the velocities, you'll see that we have that first term, which I've highlighted there with the under brace. We've got LX UP plus one minus LX UE, and that is equivalent to the linear interpolated face velocity, uf, which we saw earlier. This is fantastic. And then we have all those pressure gradients and d terms on the, on the second term in the square brackets, which you can see there. We've collected those together. And because we've now um, got that term for the linear interpolated face velocity, uf with the overbar, we can substitute that. And that allows us to go from equation 17 to equation 18. And the key trick to notice with going from equation 18 to equation 19 is we can use this technique of using an overbar to represent linear interpolation to do another stage in the simplification. And if you actually look at that term in the square brackets, what you can see there is we've got the LX and one minus LX terms appearing there, which indicate linear interpolation. And so that whole term in the square brackets is actually equal to the linear interpolated value of D multiplied by the pressure gradient uh, interpolated onto that face. And so we can simplify uh, equation 18 to arrive at equation 19. And I know that's probably quite a difficult conceptual step to get your head around, but the trick is to really just notice that there's those uh, linear interpolation factors in there, which indicate that we can simplify and use that linear interpolation notation with the overbar. So now we're there. We're almost at the final equation for the Ree and Chow correction. We've derived a formula for UF tilde, which was that unknown part of the momentum equation for the staggered cell that we need to get rid of. So we can just substitute that back in to the momentum equation uh, for our staggered cell that we derived earlier. And we arrive at equation 20, which you can see there. And we're almost at the final solution. We're almost at the Ree and Chow correction formula. The only thing we need to do is to introduce a final simplification to remove that D term outside of the brackets. 
And if you need some justification for this D term, you can, you'll find that in the paper that I've linked in the description, but I don't really want to go through that here because uh, it distracts a bit from the talk. But for now, all you need to know is that you can make the simplification that uh, DF is approximately equal to the interpolated value of D on the face of the cell. And when you do that, we can arrive at equation 22. And this is actually the final correction formula that we're going to use to calculate that face velocity on the shared face between cells P and E. We've actually arrived at the final formula. And don't worry if this formula appears a bit confusing at first, I am gonna go through the term so you are gonna understand it in a bit more detail. For now, you should have hopefully just been able to follow the process that we used, a combination of writing momentum equations and linear interpolation to arrive at this formula. And I also just signposted there that df with the overbar, just a reminder for what this d term actually is, because we've clearly got u, which is a velocity, and we've got dp dx, which is a pressure gradient. Um, but d is just, if you, if you remind yourself, it's just the volume of the cell divided by the diagonal coefficient ap. And so we've got the overbar, which indicates that we're doing linear interpolation. And so what this term actually means is, if you take the cell p on the left-hand side, just take the volume of that cell, divide it by your uh, uh, central diagonal coefficient AP. And if you do the same for the cell on the right, just take the volume of that cell, VE, and divide that by its diagonal coefficient AE, and then linear interpolate those two quantities together. That's what this DF overbar actually represents. And so what I wanted to do now is summarize and bring this all together for you as a single concise slide so you can really see what we've done here overall. And in the boxed equation that you'll see on the top there, we've got the final equation for the face velocity. This is what we were trying to do. We've got a co-located variable arrangement where we know the velocity, temperature, pressure, everything at the centroids of our cells P and E. And now we've managed to derive an equation for what the velocity will be on the face that connects those cells. And it's equal to UF with the overbar minus DF with the overbar, and then this extra term in brackets here. And what I'd like you to do is compare that to equation 24. And equation 24 is the direct formula that we'd use for the face velocity if we were using linear interpolation. And so if you compare equation 23 and equation 24, what you can see is that extra strange term in the brackets that's got some pressure gradients in it. That's the difference. That's what we've derived here using these momentum equations and rearranging. This second term is the Re and Chow correction because they're the authors who this uh, correction or additional term is originally attributed to. And it looks quite confusing, but what does it mean? Just at face glance, we can see to this formula that what we're saying is we're saying to calculate the velocity at the center of this face, uf, what we do is we use linear interpolation to get uf, and then we do something else. We do something else involving the pressure gradient, and that allows us to arrive at our final face velocity. But what does it really mean? What does this re and chow correction mean? Why is it important and why do we need it? And what I wanted to do is bring this together for you in a slide, again, to help you understand and visualize really what you're doing here. The picture on the left shows what you'd be doing if you were using just pure linear interpolation. You've got the velocity at the centroid of cell P and you've got the velocity at the centroid of cell E. You draw a straight line between those points and the fraction of the distance gives you UF. And the picture on the right shows you what the re and chow correction is doing. We're again calculating the velocity on that face, UF, but now we've got some additional term in there. And that additional term is gonna modify the value of that face velocity a slight bit. It's going to modify it by a small bit. And the key question is, well, why do we need to modify it by a small bit? And how does this term actually stop the checkerboard oscillations? It appears quite confusing. How does it actually work? Well, the key to understanding this confusing term and to understanding how it works is actually to realize and remember what the difference is between those two pressure gradients there. So just looking at that formula, we've got some, let's say some value D, that's, you could think of that as a multiplier, that's probably just going to take a scalar value, some multiplier, and then that's multiplied by a difference of two pressure gradients. We've got a dp dx evaluated on a face, and then we've got dp dx interpolated onto a face. So clearly this correction 
is some multiplier d multiplied by a difference of pressure gradients. And that's what I want you to think about a bit more in these next two slides. And so what do these different pressure gradients actually mean? Well, if you think of the first pressure gradient, dpdx, evaluated on the face, that's just going to be the pressure at the centroid of cell P, and then the, the pressure at the centroid of cell E. And again, that's the pressure gradient, so it's going to be divided by the distance between those two points. And that's got a difference of one cell. We're just taking what the gradient is directly across that face, dpdx, evaluated on the face. But if we now think of the second term in that uh, additional correction, you can see we've got dpdx interpolated onto the face because we've got the overbar. So what we're actually doing here is we're evaluating the pressure gradient two cells apart, like we did uh, in part one of this lecture series, where, for example, if we take the pressure at the centroid of P and then we take the pressure at the centroid EE two cells away and then calculate uh, and then divide by the distance between them, that will be the pressure gradient at the centroid of cell E. And then if we do the same and we take the pressure at cell E and the pressure at cell W, divide by the distance between those two points, that's going to be the pressure gradient at cell P. And then we take those two pressure gradients and interpolate them. So rather than calculating the pressure gradient directly across a face, we're calculating pressure gradients and then interpolating those pressure gradients afterwards, which is why you have that overline there. And I've tried to illustrate that for you there in the plot on the right hand side. You can see the blue lines show where you're calculating the pressure gradient, and then that red line shows that you're actually interpolating those pressure gradients together. And that gives you the dpdx with the overline, which you can see there. And in that Rian Chow correction formula that we saw on the previous slide, it's going to be the difference of those pressure gradients that we're interested in. And that difference in the pressure gradients multiplied by this, uh, this factor df will give us some correction to our face velocity, which you can see there. And what I want you to do to finish this off so that you really understand it, this is probably the most helpful bit, is to think back to that diagram which we drew before of the pressure when we move along a line, along that um, single line of cells in 1D. And you'll remember from before that in our original solution, we had those checkerboard oscillations. And the reason for the checkerboard oscillations, of course, was because we were taking those we were taking the pressure gradient from the pressure two cells apart. We had pressure in cell I plus one and pressure in cell I minus one. And then as you move along uh, the mesh from left to right, of course, there are two independent solutions at this point. So if you were to draw a line, you'd see the pressure oscillating or checkerboarding between them. And I used a similar diagram to this to explain that the first time. But you can also use this diagram to understand the difference in those pressure gradients. Now, if you think of that cell right in the middle, that's the blue circle with the dotted line around it, that's our cell P that we're interested in. And if we're working out the pressure gradient across that face, then that pressure gradient is actually equal to that downward part of the line, which you can see there. We've actually got, in this case, pressure checkerboard oscillations exist, and so that pressure gradient is quite steep. But then if we do the opposite and we calculate that other pressure gradient, then we find that that's actually equal to that top portion of the line you can see there. And you'll remember from that previous slide that what we're interested in, the correction is going to be proportional to the difference in those two pressure gradients. So because those lines are very different, they're not at the same angle, we have checkerboard oscillations. And so that means the correction itself is going to be very large. Whereas you can think of a, a different case where maybe you didn't have checkerboard oscillations. If you then drew a line through the points, actually those two sections of the lines would line up. And so the difference in dpdx on the face and dpdx interpolated onto the face would be very small. And so the Rian Chow correction would essentially be zero. It would be very small and we'd just be using linear interpolation like normal. So hopefully you can see by understanding what those different pressure gradient terms actually mean, it's the difference between them. And the difference between them will be large if you have checkerboard oscillations. And so the Rian and Chow interpolation method really zeroes in on the checkerboard oscillations and seeks to damp out and remove uh, those differences in the pressure gradients as the solution converges. And before I just 
wrap up and finish up the talk, I just want to make a few points about modern CFD codes because I think it's I think it's important to uh, take the understanding and the lessons that we've learned on how the original formula was developed and then use that in the context and understanding of modern CFD codes. And the important thing to take away from this talk is that modern CFD codes all use some form of the Rienschau interpolation method. They use some kind of correction with the same idea. They're all trying to do the same thing, and that is to remove those checkerboard oscillations when the variables are all stored at the cell centroids, when the grid is co-located. Now, even though all CFD codes will use some type of Rienschau interpolation method if, they're, if they use a co-located arrangement, they will use different forms of this correction. And so when you look through the user manuals, you may see it expressed slightly differently with additional terms or with different notation. And it's, but it's important to remember that the idea behind the correction is the same. We're always trying to do the same thing of damping and removing those checkerboard oscillations but the exact form and the notation that's used will vary between CFD codes. So my uh, advice to you would be for whatever CFD codes you use, definitely consult the user manual if you're interested in this kind of correction and definitely contact the code vendors and the co-writers themselves if you're interested in this further. It's important because it will be very different for different CFD codes and may vary between versions as well. So you need to check what version is most applicable to you. So now just to wrap up with a summary of today's talk, remember that this all applies, this Rienschau interpolation type procedure applies to co-located grids. So you've generated a mesh for your CFD code and you passed it over to the CFD solver and the CFD solver is calculating and storing all of the flow variables at the centroids of each of the cells in the mesh. And in our solution procedure, if we're using a segregated solver, the first thing we do is start by solving the momentum equations. And after we've done that, we need to calculate the velocity on the faces of those cells so we can calculate the mass fluxes in and out of the cell, which are needed to formulate the pressure correction equation. Now, when we calculate the velocities for that mass flux calculation, if we use linear interpolation directly, then the resulting uh, pressure correction equation in the pressure field can exhibit checkerboard oscillations. And Rian Chow are the authors that originally proposed a method, or the method is originally um, attributed to them, of modifying this linear interpolation procedure so that the interpolation itself uh, also has a correction which is proportional to the difference of those two pressure gradients, which we saw there a few slides ago. And all modern CFD codes use some kind of correction of this style. It may not be the exact reach out interpolation method, but they use a correction of this style to prevent the checkerboard oscillations. And for you as a user, this correction occurs inside the CFD code as part of the algorithm. So when you're running your CFD calculation, it's very rare that you'd need to consider uh, this correction or to understand what's going on. It's happening inside the CFD code. Uh, so it doesn't really matter as long as your solution converges and you aren't exhibiting any checkerboard oscillations. So that brings me to the end of part three of this three-part lecture series. I'm really hoping that by the end of this lecture series, you've got a really good understanding for Ri and Chow type interpolation and why it's needed. And also hopefully a bit of a background for how CFD codes have been developed over the past 50 years because this procedure of correcting the face velocity to account for these checkerboard oscillations really was a pivotal point that allows the CFD community to transition from the old staggered grid technology to modern uh, co-located grids and unstructured variable arrangements. So let me know in the comments section, did you find this talk interesting and useful? Could you follow the derivation and do you feel like you understand it a lot better now than you did before? I'm really hoping particularly for a lot of you who are writing research papers, uh, academic theses, uh, that you'll understand what the Rian Chow interpolation method actually means when you see it referred to, and that you actually have some confidence when you talk about it. And maybe even if you're writing your own CFD code and modifying a CFD code, for example, that you understand this correction and why it's needed. Um, I'm really hoping that this set of talks overall will be uh, an invaluable resource to the CFD community uh, as a whole, particularly if you're looking to getting into these type of algorithms in more detail. So at this point, 
I really want to thank you all for your continued support of the channel. Uh, I really do appreciate it and I hope you're getting a lot out of these lectures. Um, let me know in the comments section. I really enjoy uh, hearing from you. I really like your feedback. Uh, so thank you all very much for watching and I'll see you next time.